about analyzing anger tonight. We're looking at Proverbs 22. We're going to read verses 24 and 25. Proverbs chapter 22, uh, verses 24 and 5. Now, I know no one here has any trouble with anger or ever has, but I'm sure we all know someone that might have a little challenge <laughs> with anger. So let's try to pay attention so we can help them out. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Make no friendship, I'm reading from the King James, make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou harm, I should say, learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. I remember one church I pastored where one of the members that I knew quite well told me about their concern when they were out with a certain friend. And I said, well, you know, what are you concerned about? They said, well, I guess the best way I could say it is I'm afraid of an angry outburst. I just never know when this person's going to kind of explode. And I don't want to be around when it happens because it could be embarrassing. It could be awkward. And this is my friend. I don't really know what to do about it. And I, I, that came back to my mind as I thought about this whole concept of anger and what a life stealer it is, what an energy tap it is on us. So it's really worth analyzing it. And uh, this, these two verses kind of divide really nicely. What we want to look at first is kind of a caution from the wisest man that ever lived, let's remember, apart from the Lord Jesus, King Solomon, the, the caution to be careful of the contagious aspect of anger. We're going to see it's contagious. It can be caught, and we don't want to do that. So let's look at it. Do not become, this is my paraphrase now, do not become friends with an owner of anger, and you should not be going with a man of wrath. Listen to these other versions. Don't make friends with a quick-tempered person. Don't spend time with those who have bad tempers. Don't follow along with someone, quote, given to violent outbursts. Now, the, this begs the question, which is better, prevention or cure? Would you rather get delivered of anger after it's ruined your life? Or would you rather not get tangled and ensnared by it in advance? I found this was really interesting when I looked at the Greek version, and we always do that. I hate to keep repeating, but sometimes people might view for the first time or hear, what on earth are you talking about Greek when it's Old Covenant? Because the Greek version is the one the early church used, the one Jesus used, the one the early church taught from. So the 70, the Greek version reads, stop being an acquaintance of a furious man and stop lodging with an angry friend. This is interesting. The word friend there is philos. So it's not talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, just an acquaintance. It's talking about somebody that's a, a buddy of yours. Don't do it. Actually, the Greek version is stronger. Stop doing it. How many see the difference? Yeah, if you tell somebody, don't use that drug, the picture you paint with your words is you're sane and safe now. Don't mess it up by taking that drug. On the other hand, if you tell somebody, stop getting stoned, different picture altogether, right? They're already in the grip of the thing, and you're telling them, shake yourself loose from it. So the Greek version describes it that way. This language assumes that somebody has already taken the bait, and, and, and they shouldn't have, and they should get out of it, and it includes not just Casual contacts, but closer confidants. It uses the word philos, a friend. So when we take them together, you could say it like this. Don't get angry. Don't get ensnared by anger. Or if the person's already in that situation, like my church member's friend, stop being friends with that kind of a person. In other words, I told my, my church member, your caution is well-placed. You never know what an angry person can get you involved in. You can get involved in a fight. You can get involved in a car crash. You name it, almost anything can happen, and you won't like it. So he's saying here, be careful of contagion. And i got to tell you, I think it's sad to report we even need this advice tonight. But it seems like people will protect themselves about, against just about anything rather than something as important 
as anger. I get a kick out of this. I don't know about you. I'm driving around, making my way somewhere or another, and I will, I will pass cars, and the driver's got a mask on. <laughs> and I think, I think to myself, who are they going to get infected by in their own car with the doors closed and the windows up? And yet they're that concerned about taking a virus and they feel free to blow their top at their husband, wife, ch children, boss, or somebody else. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Sad. Now, okay, folks, okay, pastor, what's the danger? Let's suppose I don't listen to these admonitions from the wisest man that ever lived. Let's suppose I turn a, a blind eye and a deaf ear to it. What's, what's the big deal? All right, here it is so that you are not becoming familiar with his pathway, for you will receive a long-lasting snare for your soul. That's pretty heavy stuff. Uh, I only know, you know a little bit about Hebrew from study helps, but I know Solomon could uh, verify this. The, the, as far as I've been told, the Hebrew perfect tense is very much like the Greek. It means something that takes place at a moment in time with an ongoing result. So the picture here is if you and I uh, get that contagious emotion of anger, if it gets a hold of us, hard to get rid of. It's not a one-off. It kind of traps you. It traps you. Other versions put it like this lest you copy his paths. I like this. Get yourself into a trap. Learn their habits and not be able to change. Where in the world did you get that, that habit of blowing your top over the smallest things? Well, one thing about it, I wanted to be just like dear old dad. <laughs> and so... There it is. And all of the friends that are running when they see you show up are saying, you succeeded and we're not happy about it. Nobody wants to be around an ang angry person except an idiot. No one wants that kind of person around, right? Now, watch this again. Look at, listen to what the 70 says, the Greek version. Lest you receive a noose for your soul. From an emotion? A noose? I mean, I looked this up. It, this word translates vrohus, vrohus, which means a snare, a noose, or actually a halter. I don't know if you've ever been up close and personal to a donkey or a burro or a horse or a pony, but you may notice sometimes you'll see this bit in their mouth and a bridle. Okay. Other times you might say, well, how in the world are they controlling that horse? You can see something over the horse's head, but there's no bit in the mouth, right, to, to adjust their head or where the, it's just going around their head. That's a halter. It doesn't have a bit, but guess what? It'll control the horse. That You put a lead line on the end of that halter, and you can lead that horse without a bit being in its mouth. When my uh, first horse, Bill, got real old, he let me know one afternoon that he didn't want the bit anymore and he didn't want the saddle. Uh, if I told you how he did it, you wouldn't believe me, but he did it. He communicated very clearly, I'm not into this anymore. And it, finally, he had his chin on the ground, and I'm still holding the bit and bridle. I'm trying to ride. His chin, his head is that low. Never did that. I thought, what on earth? And finally, I'm a slow study, but I got it eventually. Oh my gosh, he's communicating. I took, hung up the bridle, brought over a halter. His head came right up. Slipped the halter over his head, no problems. Didn't even bother with the saddle. Just hooked the other end of the lead rope to the halter, and I rode him bareback for the rest until he went to heaven. But think about that. Just You can lead, you can lead a thousand-pound horse with a lead rope attached to a halter. If they've been taught right, they're stuck. They're stuck. And they can't get out of it. And this is the picture here of anger. It catches us. And let me just mention this because we're going to be there in just a tick. This revelation of the word snare, that anger can become a snare that permanently traps us, that concept is echoed by the Apostle Paul, think about it, a thousand years later. A thousand years into the future, 
we find the Jewish Apostle Paul agreed with King Solomon regarding this very damaging, draining emotion that we know as anger. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Angry man, angry guy, angry... What about women? Don't they ever lose their tempers? Of course not. We know that. That sweet thing would never be angry, right? Oops. Let me remind us, first of all, that Solomon knew women intimately, right? I mean, if you have, if you have uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines, you're, you're going to learn something about women by accident, right? And this is what he said about women. Just look one chapter earlier, Proverbs 21. Verse 19 affirms this. Better to dwell in the wilderness land than with a woman of contentions and vexation. Other versions have it, quarreling and complaining. Another version, bitter-tongued and angry. Still another, nagging and ill-tempered. So whether it's men, whether it's women, the same picture painted, volatile emotion, it's damaging, it's contagious. And according to these old covenant references, it can actually be soul trapping, where you can, in a sense, be hooked on anger, like you can be hooked on alcohol or illegal drugs or anything else you want to think about. You can be hooked on it. I know people that are hooked on working out. You, you, can, you can make an addiction out of anything. Well, how do I know if I'm addicted or not? Can you say no? Or do you absolutely have to have your workout? Do you absolutely have to do this, that, or the other thing? You know, yeah, some people, Barb's telling me, are addicted to their phones. That's really quite something. Uh, if you don't believe me, look around sometime. Try to have a conversation with somebody today, a meaningful one. Very difficult if they've got a phone anywhere near them. Huh? What? Huh? What did you say? What? <laughs> They're looking down here, and you're across the table. What? Who? What? And then you talk to them later. Did you finish that? What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Well, we talked about it over lunch. We did? I don't remember. Well, I wonder why. Addicted to that phone. I got a message on it. <laughs> I think I called it the idol in your hand. That's not one of my real popular ones. Anyway, let's, let's go to the New Testament now. I told you I would. How many remember that word snare? It's amazing. It's amazing because, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep it light, but still, uh, not make, I'm not making this up. Paul actually got the same revelation a thousand years later. He'd be real comfortable with King Solomon. I imagine they're still talking about things. So we've looked at the, the be careful of contagion, the warning. If you're not already caught, don't be. If you are, goodness gracious, get out of it. Let's analyze it now. What is behind it? When you and I blow our tops, when we say those things we regret, when we write the letter and wish we hadn't done. Do you know it's been decades and decades, probably I'd say close to 50 years, occasionally I still think about a letter I wrote to a girl I was dating. I remember the moment of truth when I stood by the mailbox and I had that <laughs> Should I or shouldn't I? And I did. As soon as I let it go, my heart kind of sank. You know, I thought, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And I found out months later, one of her girlfriends went to the place where I worked, said, you broke her heart. I, th I said, I what? <laughs> didn't you? And I said, no, I didn't know. I told her, blah, 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 blah. Just call me if, if I'm misunderstanding. All that. It didn't work out. And, and I tell you what. Yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, my child bride is complaining or, or rejoicing. Um, it, it's amazing that you can do things when you're angry or hurt that make no sense. And if you and I would just do what I'm going to suggest in a few minutes, life could be a, a lot smoother and we wouldn't have so many woulda, coulda, shoulda, mighta, oughta uh, moments in our own mind. So what's behind it? This is real simple, but it's profound, in my opinion. That's why we need this book. You can pay 150 bucks a pop for a 45-minute hour with a psychiatrist or the psychologist. They might not be able to tell you what I'm telling us tonight. They may actually encourage you to express your anger. You'd be surprised what people think about anger. It's amazing. But uh, that's why we don't, 
We don't need help from people that have problems themselves. As far as I know, psychiatrists are still in the top four uh, suicide columns for jobs. Yeah. Psycho as, far as, I'm, as far as I remember, it, they're still in the top four. So why would you take advice from somebody that winds up topping themselves? You know, they're trying to give you help and they cancel their own ticket. What I'm saying is we should at least be open to information that comes from a higher place. This is not something that I dreamed up or that King Solomon, ah, I wonder, gosh, I ran out of space here. I should probably add a little bit, you know, or Paul, he gets to the end of the letter. Hmm, oh, I'll just throw this in. No, this came from God. If you have your New Testament open now, here it is. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4. What's behind this volatile emotion? Basically two things. Satan, Satan himself, and or, and or our flesh. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 26 and 27. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Be angry, the King James says, right? And sin not. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. Here's what it actually says. Be angered. Be angered and stop sinning. The sun, let it not be setting upon your provocation. Neither be giving place to the devil. Now, I've looked at this a time or two in the past in different connections, but when I read the Proverbs verse, this just shouted at me, and I thought, you know what? I'm talking to different people usually every time I speak, or we don't know who's going to watch this particular video or listen to this download. So here it is again. This is worth its weight in gold. If, if you know someone who's got an anger problem and they're not enjoying it, I know, we, like I said, we don't have that, but someone we know might. Here it is. The verb is passive, not active. What do you mean, Pastor? I had a counselor tell me in seminary, he was talking to a bunch of us about different things, you know, related to counseling people when you're in the ministry. We talked about anger. He said, well, you got to get that out. And I said, well, it says that anger is a sin. James says that uh, the person that's angry is not accomplishing the righteousness of God. Well, good luck with your life if that's the way you're going to treat anger. And I didn't know enough at that point to call him an idiot because that's what he was. According to God's word, which he professed to believe and use in his counseling, God doesn't say, be angry, just watch how you do it, and don't sin. You, know, you can blow your top, but not all the way off. You, know, you can get them told, but let them turn pink, but not red. The Bible doesn't say that. It's not active at all. Be angry but just don't sin with it. No, it doesn't say that. It's passive voice. Be angered and stop sinning. Be angered. Yeah, don't react. Don't react. Respond. I've studied a number of different martial arts. The one that I'm most fond of is the one, thank God, I was licensed to teach, is Aikijitsu. Aikijitsu translates to the art of of harmony with spirit. And there were three basic principles of it. The first is never meet force with force. Never meet force with force. Another one was lower the apex. That is to say, try to get your opponent's head low. And the other tenant, third tenant, was circular motion. And to me, that illustrates how to deal with anger very well. For example, if someone is throwing a punch, I can block it, right? I can try to punch them first, or I could just turn, couldn't I? I actually wrote a short story where I've got a guy, a mafia bum, punching somebody, and the detective, all, he doesn't fight back, he just turns, and the man keeps going and punches the wall. And, and this, is, this is what... We're talking about psychologically. Never meet force with force. Don't react in kind to the stimulation. We could look at it another way. Don't take the bait. Remember, there's, it, it can become a snare. You can be caught by it. How many like to have their buttons pushed? It's no fun, is it? You wind up in a hot, 
hot uh, atmosphere, you, you wind up worked up, your blood pressure goes up, your pulse is through the roof, and for what? For what? Just because somebody else wanted their way at your expense. Or you're angry at them. Why? You want your own way. Who on God's green earth or in his blue heaven ever said you and I are entitled to our own way? That's where anger comes from. Demanding our own way. Who ever promised us we could have our own way? Don't let the sun be setting on your provocation. What a word. It's a mouthful. Parorismus, anger, rage, wrath, exasperation. Don't let that live in your house overnight. Best, don't let it happen in the first place. Forewarned is forearmed, right? What is better, prevention or cure? A lot of people bless their hearts with this virus and all of its different uh, mutations. They're doing their best to be vaccinated, right? And I know so many people, sadly, they're vaccinated, they're boosted, and they've had it two or three times. Regardless, wouldn't it be nice to be able to isolate yourself from it some way? And so that's what we're on about here. Now, notice the scene beside, behind the scene here. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Neither be giving place to the devil. Can we rewind just very briefly? What's, what's back of anger? Satan or our own flesh? Why do we know that? Well, Brother Joe said so. No, Brother Paul said so. Stop giving place to the devil. The word there is topon. It means a, like a plot of land. I don't know if you were involved or not, but I was. Back in the charismatic renewal, back in the 60s and 70s, among many other things that were taught, you, you heard about this, don't have open doors to the devil. And back in the day, they were, they were recommending little kids shouldn't watch science fiction, you know, or Superman, they open doors, that will open doors, you know, and if you watch the wrong show or read the wrong book, oh, dear Lord, you're waving a red flag at Satan like a, like a bull, you know. You can, you can search the scripture for advice like that. Listen to me. You can, you can search the scripture, and you can find scripture an inch long that talks about open doors because of something we read or some movie we, we saw or, or whatever, some experience. No, but you can find two open doors that are actually spelled out in the Bible. Two things that open the door, quote unquote, or give the devil not just a doorway, but a plot of land in our lives. The first is anger. Stop giving the devil topon, a, a place in your life, a plot of land. Satan is back of anger. What else is Satan back of? Anybody know? Rebellion. Rebellion. He is the original rebel. He's back of rebellion. How do we know that, Pastor? Write this one down. You won't hear this preached on much. Some, some preachers bless their hearts. They have a backbone like a, like a spaghetti. Uh, they just go with the flow, and they're afraid of hurting somebody's feelings, especially people that give a lot. They don't want to make them mad, so they won't tell the truth no matter you know, what God's telling them to talk about. Watch this. Here's another scripture. Write this one down. 2 Timothy 2.26. 2 Timothy 2.26. We're, we're, we're analyzing anger, trying to find out the source. It's Satan using our flesh. Why? Satan is full of anger, and Satan is full of rebellion, and they're both connected. This is what Paul's talking about in 2 Timothy 2, 26. He's first of all describing a place, and ministers will understand this. A lot of ministers I'm talking to know what I'm talking about because some of them are in it right now looking for a way out. There can rise up in any local assembly a spiritual hothead. You know, you know the kind I'm talking about. They're always in trouble with any kind of authority figure. They grew up having trouble with teachers, they have any kind of authority figure in their life, they'll cause trouble. Now, follow this. Correction from the bottom is always rebellion. Correcting somebody in authority, regardless of what you think they did 
good, bad, or indifferent. It's always rebellion, and God never honors it. Never. He never honors rebellion. Well, now, if that preacher's a crook, and, you know, we all know it, you mean we shouldn't just rise up and get him told? No, you should not. Well, well, what in the world should we do? Simplest thing in the world, go to another church. If everybody in that crooked preacher's church up and leaves, guess what? The crooked preacher is out of business, and he'll have to get a real job. Instead of pretending to be something, then he isn't. Isn't that simple? What did we do when we left Mother England? We didn't like that, right? We didn't like uh, the authority situation. Did, did we try to kill the king? No, we left, went to America. Now, when they pushed the envelope and wouldn't even let us be away, we had to do something to preserve our freedom here. They were chasing us. How many are tracking with me? This is deep. You won't find this on any street corner. People don't want to talk about this. Most people wouldn't know the devil if they walked into him wearing a Santa Claus outfit. Well, one thing about it, I don't believe in the devil. You don't have to. You don't have to. He likes it that way. As a matter of fact, if you don't, man, I know we're all, we're all born idiots, but you think we should wake up sooner or later. You know, I'm not enjoying this. I go to bed mad. I, you know, I sit up for two hours while, while I kind of calm down again. And your arteries and your heart, they love that. God's concerned about our health when he said, stop being angry. Stop letting the sun go down on your provocation. Stop giving place to the devil in your life. Now here it is. Paul is talking to people, as I've just mentioned, in the church that are rising up against God's constituted authority. In 2 Timothy, he's talking about the apostle and prophet and pastor Timothy. People were getting in his face. And Paul said, look, do this. Do your best to be meek, to be mild, and to teach these people. Why? So that God might give them the gift of a change of mind. Now watch this. Here's 2 Timothy 2.26, my translation. And that they, the idiots, and that they may awake as out of a drunken stupor. Watch this. Out of the devil's snare. Did we have that word earlier in Proverbs? Anger brings what? A snare. It'll put a halter on your head. And then Satan can just pull the lead rope, take you anywhere he wants. That they may awake as out of a drunken stupor, out of the devil's snare. Look at this. Having been taken captive by him, Satan, for the will of that one. Paul actually used a demonstrative pronoun, not just him, personal pronoun, a demonstrative pronoun, that one. You could just imagine Paul pointing. Who's that one? That one's the rebellious one, full of anger, that stormed the gates of heaven and said, I'll be above the Most High. How'd that work out for him? Not so well. So, what is Paul telling Timothy? With meekness, try to teach these folks if maybe God will give them the gift of a change of mind about his authority in the local church. And they'll recognize it's me, 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 Lord, standing in the need of prayer rather than pointing a finger. It's Sister Hope Nanny and somebody else. So let me bring this to a close. And if you have questions, Barb is here to answer them. <laughs> An angry person, beloved, is a fearful person. An angry person is a fearful person under the control of a dark spirit called Satan who demands his own way regardless of the cost, regardless of the con ca carnage. This is a typical, I don't know what came over me. Where are they telling you this from? In, for, the other side of the glass. The, they're, in, they're, they're in jail. And they're, I, don't, I don't know what came over me, Pastor. I had people that I visited in the clink, you know, and they'll say things like, I don't know why the Lord has me here. And I'm thinking, brother, it wasn't the Lord at all. The law has you here because you got involved in a drunken brawl, because you lost your temper, because you gave in to the rebellious, angry, dark force called Satan. So what can we do? Don't take the bait. Just don't take the bait. Forewarned, forearmed. Prevention better than cure. Recognize your anger or theirs is based on fear. 
But here's the good news for you, for me, for every believer. This is worth any amount of money in this or any other world. This is not the real you, this angry, angry person. The real you is Christ in you. How many of you know that's true? Paul said, for in Christ there, there is neither male or female. There is no gender in our God. But Christ in all and is all. The real you is not afraid or angry about anything or anyone and never will be. The other day I was in my office and I had somebody come to my mind I hadn't thought of in a long time. And I had this strong impression, pray for this person, pray for their family and their ministry. I thought, well, and I don't want to. And I thought, well, why don't I want to? And then I remembered this person was a great deal of problem for me for quite a while. I did not realize there was still some negative on, on and off in there. I thought, whoops, what'd you do, pastor? Pray three days till your pants fell down and fasted three days? No, I mean like that. I made an adjustment. Lord, I bring before you, name them by name, the ministry of the church, and I, Lord, I place them by faith. If I could baptize them, I would. I place them into the very depths of the blood of Jesus. And in my mind's eye, I could see them covered with the blood, completely covered for cleansing, for quarantine from all the work of the enemy. Lord, let all the benefits of your atonement from the incarnation to the exaltation apply to them, their family, their ministry, anything and everything appertaining to them. I came, just a few minute prayer. I came out of that. I could have danced my way to the stars. I haven't had that, those people come to my mind at all. I think God saw something there that might have been holding me back some way or another. I didn't know about it. Well, I could preach for a month tonight. I wonder why that is. I, I just want people to learn from my mistakes. I don't think I'm all that different from everybody else. Just this week, I'm driving on my own business. Um, I, you've, I've mentioned this before. All preachers are rich, and I, was having my, I just had my breakfast at McDonald's. Got out of there for, for free. Their system was down, bless her heart. The lady it was cash only. I had cash, gave them a bill. She changed my bill for me. They gave me the whole bill back because I'm a regular. So I got free oatmeal. You can't beat that. And a senior coffee. You know, I get out of there for less than three bucks, but it didn't even cost me three bucks. And I'm driving along. All of a sudden, something came to my mind. I'm crying like a baby. I was crying so hard, I thought I was going to have to pull off the road. And all these different things came to my mind. Things from the past, things I was concerned about in the future. I thought, what in the world? Where did this come from? Finally made it to the office, just let her rip. And when it was all over, I thought, dear God, that was in my kilia. That was in my belly, in my emotional place. We t talked about this, the second brain, the enteric nervous system. It was down here. Didn't even know it was there. Was I glad it came out? What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying most of us don't really know what's going on inside of us unless the Lord shows us. And that can come any number of ways. Somebody can tell you something. You can read something. You can watch a TV show. You can hear a song. You can read something in the scripture. You can have a dream. Someone can give you a word of prophecy. It comes in different ways. But when it comes, suddenly, wow, where have I been? Where? I didn't know I had all that going on down there. And then it's gone. What's that got to do with anger? What can I do about anger? Well, here it is. Just a couple of suggestions. A couple natural ones and one supernatural one. The first thing is to stop. Just stop. Have you ever heard of count to ten? When you feel yourself getting worked up? I've never done it, but they reckon it helps. Just count to ten. The, the important thing is do not react. If you react, it's like they push a button and the angry person is now in charge of you. Not only are they miserable, but they've made you miserable because they brought you down to their level. You took the bait and you're, you're caught. You're in a snare now. Now you got to figure out how to get your way out. So stop. Don't react. Well, if I don't react, what do I do? Respond. If I react, they're in charge. If I respond, I'm in charge under God. Don't take my word for this. 
Look at the words of Jesus in the Gospels. You will find very, very often he speaks in I statements. I statements. Someone tries to rile you up and accuse you. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what I meant was, perhaps I misspoke. What I meant was, and it'll start to dawn on the, oh, wow. Oh, wow. I have made a mistake. And that's good news, right? Here's two other things you can do physically. This works. This works. Try it anytime you want. Relax your tongue. What? Relax your tongue. If you, if you observe yourself, you will find most of the time your tongue is against your teeth or it's, it's hard. It's pressing against something. If you just relax your tongue, just let it be in the middle of your mouth, not against your teeth, or, you will immediately feel yourself relax. The second thing you can do is relax your eyes. They've done studies about this. You can look it up. They've done studies about that. Relax your eyes. What do you mean? Most of us are slightly squinting all the time. We're slightly intense. The other day, I was doing it at a drive through I found myself worked up. I thought, what am I worked up about? And I remembered this. Relax your tongue, dumbbell. I relaxed my tongue. Relax your eyes. You know like when you, when you uh, get engrossed in a novel and someone says, hey, you coming for dinner? Uh, what, what? Or you're watching television. Aren't you coming in here yet? Uh, what? What you've done is relaxed your eyes. Almost let them go out of focus, however you want to do that. You know it when you do it. You will immediately change your physical body. You'll move from the beta brain wave, which is kind of active, our waking state, to alpha, which is slower and lower. It's a place where you and I daydream. It's the first part of sleep. It's a nice place to live. The more you and I can stay in alpha rather than beta, the better it will be for our physical and emotional and psychological self. So I would suggest those two things you can do physically. Just relax your tongue. Relax your eyes. And then you'll be able to respond rather than react. You could diffuse the whole thing without ever even getting into a discussion. You can sometimes turn it off right there. The, th the third thing you can do, of course, is something spiritual. You can just undertone pray in other tongues. While they're letting you have it, just pray undertone. They don't know what you're doing. Just pray in other tongues. When I was having a procedure, it was about two hours long, longer than I expected because they had some problems. And I was just praying undertone. And my doctor asked me twice, are you okay? Because maybe he could tell something what's going on. I said, well, I'm great. I'm great. Maybe he thought I was talking to him or something. I wasn't. It's was just talking undertone in tongues. And I had a great time. I didn't need half the medication they usually give you this. Male nurse kept asking, you sure you don't want any more? I said, no, I'm good. I'm good. God's in his heaven. All's right with the world, you know. But it was probably because I was talking in tongues. So that's the third thing we can do. Real quick, we can, we can just shift gears. Flip the switch, as I say, tag out, and let the Holy Spirit work. You can do all three. You don't have to choose. And that's how we can avoid this energy-draining emotion that we're told to do without called anger. Anybody questions or input, output? Anyone? Anywhere? So, uh, when I now at this talk uh, on this subject, when Jesus overturned the, the tables, the money changers, what was that? That that was what we we hear about as um, righteous indignation. And right? Now, what's the difference? That's a very good point, Andy. What's the difference when he turned that over? Who was he defending? His father's house. It was, he was not defending himself. He was not demanding his own way. He wasn't angry at those people for not doing what he wanted them to do. He was defending. Most of our, none of our indignation is righteous. It's a, it's a joke. None of ours is righteous. It's never righteous. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said man's anger doesn't accomplish God's righteousness. That's as simple as you can make it, period. There's never a reason to let this burn in our bodies or to become victims of someone else's. And you can see in other places, don't be, it said this, don't be in the presence of an angry person unless you learn his ways. Watch who you hang out with. 
you hang out with idiots, guess what? A lot of people do that, and then they see it taking effect. Yeah. Them yeah, them. sure. Then they'll keep doing it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they're in charge, and they draw you into their mess. And we don't have to live there, thank God. The real us, the inner man, the inward man, the hidden man of the heart, is not afraid and is not angry at anything or anyone, never will be, it's because Christ is not. I'll bet. Right. Yeah, you know, even a, a, a non-spiritual martial art knows that much, you know. Don't be there. Don't meet force with force, if at all possible. Sure. Yeah. Put him out of the car, and it's like the peace came over me. And what did you like? The Lord gave me a word, and I, I'm hearing it as I'm saying. Sure. He said, he said, "You're the one also that who messed up that address with the important one." Is we can find each other, and that this is the worst thing ever happened to us. We'll be doing pretty good. And he said, "Yeah, I love you too." Wow. What did you avoid I by doing that? I loved him, and he can fight. Like, sure. Lord. Yeah. What did we avoid when we do that? Yeah. It's it's almost kind of fun. You can experiment with it. It's almost kind of fun. But it's, it's, boy, I tell you what, it saves you a lot of energy. That's what we're going to look at anxiety next week. In my opinion, from everything I've read, even in the natural, anger and anxiety are real energy sappers. Someone that's got unresolved anxiety, fear, or someone that's got unresolved anger, they're not going to have a lot of energy for life. And there's scripture for that, too. I would never tell you anything that is not scripture willingly. Yeah, right. And try to be kind. Yeah, yeah, Bill. No, go for it. I had a friend, not a friend, but I was working with years ago, and he had a lot of stress and mental problems and stuff. And what he did was in the bathtub, he would put his hand on the bathtub, and he would pray and say, Lord, help me to get out of the bathtub. And it would help him to get out of the bathtub. Yeah, wow, sure. Yeah. Better than better than getting involved. Once it works. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what if we teach people here? We can be known as the sink church, <laughs> the tub church, the basin, up there on the, altar. the basin church. Yeah, right. Work at responding rather than reacting. It, it'll work out better for us. Thank you.